Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show. Welcome. This is episode 11 of Forensics Talks. I've broken the the 10 episode barrier, which is pretty cool. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started here. And the uh, first one is that uh, I'm going to be having that Cloud Compare course that's coming up on November 23rd. There's been a whole bunch of people that have registered, which is really fantastic. Um, if you're working with 3D technologies, uh, photogrammetry, laser scanning, and you're interested in doing more, uh, Cloud Compare is an open source program that um, is available, and I'm offering a little training package on there to go from zero to, uh, you know, being proficient at editing and doing stuff with with your uh, 3D point clouds. Also, there is a conference uh, uh, ne just next week. It's the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysts, and that's a full week of um, uh, different sessions. So there's three sessions. There's an uh, European session. There's an America session, and an Asian uh, Asia Pacific session. So if you're interested in bloodstain pattern analysis, uh, it's for 30 bucks. It's a great deal to get to. Uh, you get access to all the uh, presentations, and I believe they're actually being recorded. So if you can't make some of the sessions, you can get on them uh, later on as well. So we're going to get started uh, uh, just with a very brief introduction here for my uh, speaker, my guest today. Um, it's Dr. William Lewinsky, and uh, he has a, uh, a BA in psychology and sociology from Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Uh, he has a PhD in psychology from Union Institute and University Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, with a concentration on police psychology. Uh, from 1987 to 1992, he was the director of the law enforcement program at uh, Mankato State University. Um, uh, 1997 to 98, uh, Chair of Political Science and Law uh, Enforcement Department. Uh, 2003 to present, he's the Director of the Forest Science Institute, and that's going to be a lot about what we talk about today. Um, uh, Dr. Lewinsky's been involved in a lot of research uh, in training and consultation. He's uh, presented at many conferences and has provided training for thousands of officers, um, especially the uh, the force uh, the force science certification course. Um, interestingly, he was a clinical psychologist before, so he has some experience there with uh, working with children with disabilities, child development and support services in Winnipeg, Canada. And uh, we were just talking about it from 1980 to now, for a very long time. He's the uh, chief instructor of Mankato Goju uh, Kai Karate Club, and I think that's pretty cool. I used to take karate when I was a kid, so let's bring him in here. Uh, there you are. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Fine, fine. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you today. Yes, thank you. Thanks, thanks for taking some time out. I know you're a busy person, and uh, I appreciate you being here and sharing some of your knowledge and experience. Um, the first thing that I want to ask is something that I ask everybody, and that is, um, you know, a lot of students or even people in other professions right now maybe one day want to get into uh, into the area that you're looking at, be human behaviors and that sort of thing, and. Um, how did you fall into this? And so think think about when you first started and what made you think about psychology and then how, what was the path that brought you to where you are today? Actually, I started reading psychology. I read my introductory textbook for psychology. My first year was at Loyola University of Chicago and the introductory psychology textbook, I read the, the summer between the 10th and 11th grade at uh, Port Arthur Collegiate Institute. I just happened to pick it up. I was interested in it. Uh, and I've been on that track ever since. In the police world, I came to a nexus out of the martial arts experience. I was teaching uh, arrest and control techniques, happened to be working with the, uh, with the Mounties while I was working with the Manitoba Department of Education as a uh, psychologist with them. Uh, and uh, they, they were sharing some of the hostage negotiation techniques that we're learning uh, out of Ottawa. And when the most dramatic hostage situation in Canadian history happened, it's the Oak Lake Verdon hostage situation. I was called in initially to do the debriefing, but I ended up actually out at the scene uh, and directed the negotiation strategy that caused this, uh, this individual who had murdered uh, a member of their sex club in Saskatchewan. I uh, got in a shootout with the RCMP, killed one, wounded two, hit four hostage situations, changing hostages, guns, ammo, not barricaded, ending up as a doctor's residence full-blown psychopathic paranoid off his medication, uh, determined to stay there until his wounded spouse could travel. And at that point, my clinical supervisor was chairperson of the Canadian Psychiatric Association. I called Harry up and I said, Harry, we got this situation. And he said, if you don't get him out of there within three days, he's gonna decompensate and kill everybody. 
And so we use strategies that had never been done before, primarily taken from Adlerian psychology. Uh, and we drove that situation to a successful conclusion. And in the middle of that, and you have to think January in Manitoba Prairie, mm -hmm. it got to 20 below was the warmest. <laughs> the SWAT team was out for six hours at a time. Uh, cold weather, I, it was an amazing team performance. And um, I love being a support for that type of service and decide I would change the direction of my life and uh, structured it so that I could actually uh, end up teaching and working in the law enforcement area, in the area of psychological and human performance support. Okay. And so if we talk about where you are today with the Force Science Institute, I mean, it's been around a while. I mean, it's not like a recent thing. Maybe some people are hearing about it more recently, but I mean, I've heard about it. It's geez, it's years and years now. So um, right. who were some of the founding people in, in the uh, Force Science Institute? Well, one of the first things we did was establish, um, uh, Patricia, the co-owner of Force Science, Patricia Thiem and I, established a national advisory board, um, which, uh, which brought in all sorts of elements. Because when you start looking at human performance in high stress, whether you're looking at training or you're looking at forensic analysis, uh, you're looking at a variety of components, perception, cognition, uh, motor performance, learning skills, and educational process, uh, you know, all of those, uh, we're complex human beings. And if you go to a university uh, psychology department, you'll see we're fractionated. Even our mind is fractionated into all sorts of components. <laughs> and so we needed a broad-based uh, board to facilitate that. Uh, and then we started moving forward uh, initially with research uh, and then with, uh, with training. And now our, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but now we've got uh, a really a most credentialed uh, training staff in any uh, police course, I think, uh, in the world today. Yeah, for sure. Well, a lot of what you do is, I mean, there's different aspects to your business. So one aspect is um, going to be the, the research that you guys do. You guys do plenty of research. Uh, mm -hmm. Another aspect is the training. And then the other aspect, uh, aspect is going to be consultation. You do some consultation work as well. Um, right. So what is, if you had to summarize uh, what Force Science uh, Institute does or what their mandate is, how, how would you best describe that? Well, I think what we're, our, our primary focus has always been to understand, to assess and to measure and to understand the types of circumstances officers get into so we can then better prepare uh, them for the circumstances that they will encounter. Uh, and so it's, it's really a training uh, perspective. Uh, off that, we have a, um, um, a forensic or a consultation perspective uh, that then serves as we try to translate that information into a forensic analysis of an incident, how does it relate? Um, and then the, uh, the main component uh, that we, well, we're committed to is the issue about bringing the knowledge of human performance science to those who are investigating and also training uh, in the police world. So yeah. the, we have a, a three course mission, but it's all driven by research. Um, for instance, could I give you an example? Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, I was, I was on a meeting today with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, two subcommittees, and we're looking at recommending changing in the police profession based on what we learned about how well skills are learned and retained in, in the academy. We spent a million dollars uh, on a five-year research project, primarily culminating on three years of data collection analysis and, and, and presentation. 10,000 videos made on skill acquisition, perishability of that skill over the course of the academy, up to six months uh, after the academy. Uh, amazing study, never been done before, uh, published in a behavioral analyst journal. Uh, and the end result is uh, officers leave the academy. It doesn't matter what skill we have taught them. They leave the academy to the point where they're not functional in a real world encounter. Okay. And that holds true with whether we're talking about the Ontario Police College or whether we're talking about uh, Minnesota State University Mankato law enforcement program, mm -hmm. or whether we're talking about the Oregon Police Academy, it, it doesn't matter. It's how we teach it uh, and uh, how many hours we, we teach and the fact that we do almost no decision making by the time people leave the process. So our research is directing us to uh, and allow us to make changes within the police profession. 
But if we look at another element, which would be, for instance, uh, how long it takes officers to, uh, for instance, to respond to a threat and how that relates to bullet strikes in relation to subject movement in an encounter. That's tremendously supportive for training, for pre-event assessment, for positioning to establish contain and control an incident, for the use of communication to offset that. But if it does result in a shooting, uh, all the decision and performance are made before the bullet strikes the body. Yeah. And so what are the human performance elements that go into that? And so it all kind of links together from the point of view of analysis, training, performance issues. Well, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to ask you, I have some other things I want to ask you about on the research side, because, and there's, there's a lot there. There's more than we can fit into, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 45 minutes, but um, let's talk about, I, I want to start sort of, I, I think it's good if we talk about um, some of the, or let me ask you, what are some of the, the physical, the chemical, the mental, and even emotional uh, changes that happen to people who are under high stress scenarios? It, it really runs from, uh, it, it runs a range uh, because we have a variety of, of human psychological strengths uh, and, and experiences. So it runs from, and I've interviewed, advised counsel well over 3,000 3, officers been involved in shooting situations. And on one end uh, is the officer who is focused intently on trying to respond to the threat and direct themselves to the threat. And by the way, we find the same sorts of psychological and performance elements uh, in special uh, special operations teams with the military, force recon, Delta team, SEAL team, et cetera. We're looking at a, a focus on solving the problem uh, and an emotional utilization to commit to the solution of, that, that, uh, of the problem that presents itself to them. Uh, and so it's, it's a really intense and very successful uh, focus and performance. When it when it comes to the human, I was I was showing the picture of the brain here. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to know um, what parts of the brain kick in when someone is, you know, shocked under, you know, just has to make a quick decision, fear or whatever. I mean, is there, you know, you know, if you're calm and you're just thinking, and you know, you're using one part of your brain versus another part of your brain, um, how does all that affect? decision making memory all those things well if if you think about it the the individual who's really focused on trying to solve the problem is really very frontal lobed engaged uh, and their emotional response their amygdala and their hippocampus uh, are really in service of that purpose there's an emotional intensity intensity that is used by these individuals but it's under the control and regulation of their frontal lobes their thought process and their experience and the decisions usually are rapid made in a particular type of fashion called RPD or fast and frugal, but it's really an effective performance usually. On the other end of the spectrum, totally on the other end, are officers whose frontal lobes are shut down. And literally, uh, we've been able to measure this with infrared spectrometry. We've been able to, to measure the decrease in the functioning of the frontal lobes as the amygdala, the emotional response center, begins to get activated. And officers are literally recoiling. And instead of shooting to stop the threat or addressing the threat, they are recoiling and trying to save their life. They will run, they will hide, they will freeze, they will do a variety of things, but it will not be productive. Yeah, no, that's, absolutely. That's because the low, it's the low road of the brain. It's a survival, the primitive survival component uh, is, is taking over and they're emotionally recoiling. And it's the negative components of that. It's the and, freeze and, and the flight uh, elements. And I, and I know you've done a lot of studies on reaction time and, and that sort of thing. So when a person is, um, if, if we are subject to these very primitive sort of reactions and things like that, are there ways to train to offset those sort of primitive instincts? Yeah, you, yes, yes, there are. And I want to point out there's a confusion about this. Because people think that if you expose somebody to a stress uh, set or a, a set of stress circumstances, that you will inoculate them to uh, some sort of negative reaction. And stress and time are both similar in that time does not heal. It is what occurs during time that allows you to heal. 
And under stress circumstances, it's the same sort of thing. It is not stress that we inoculate ourselves to. It is how we prepare and build what we need to, to work effectively under that type of stress. So stress allows us to develop those resources. It's kind of like a muscle needs to be stressed to grow. And we need to be exposed in sequential ways to become familiar, to become skillful, to have confidence to operate in a particular situation. So we need confidence, we need competence, uh, and we need exposure into the type of circumstances that will be confronting us, that will cause that emotional arousal, that will either turn positive or negative depending upon how we use it and what we bring to that incident. Mm -hmm. If you look at the current, um, let's say current models for training across globally even uh, for police officers and looking at the the format of the training, looking at the duration of the training um, and looking at how well the training actually, you know, can be put into practice. Um, I, I, I've read some things that you have commented on saying that there's a lot of deficiencies there. Uh, for example, uh, like block training and, and the disadvantages of doing typical block training and that sort of thing. Can you comment on, on some of the um, the changes that need to happen in the current training models for law enforcement? Certainly, um, <clears throat> teaching things all at once, all together in a block, needs to be eliminated. Blocks are very good to begin to develop a skill, and then you need to integrate it with other skills, which is also eliminating the silo format. Because if you teach like one arrest and control technique, totally apart from another, totally apart from another, an officer goes to arrest somebody, and it turns into a free fall, they're using all of those together in that free for all. And, and so we need to look at that, how it fits together. Communication is taught in a silo apart from any force. And so we need to link all of what we teach together. So block and silo need to be eliminated and we need to do a little bit, a lot and integrate it. But here's, here's the key. Speak to a law enforcement officer. Ask them what they do, and they'll tell you they're making decisions all the time. If they're going to make a decision about what is the best recommendation or persuasion that they could provide for someone in a domestic battery situation, for instance, that's a decision process. If they're going to work on, uh, uh, say, that they stop a teenager hitchhiking, there's information that says that person has a 50% chance of being the victim of a sexual or physical violence situation. Uh, in the residence. And how do they approach that person to facilitate a discovery of that? That's a decision process. Mm -hmm. Cops are making decisions all day long. But if you look at any, any police academy, there's only a handful of decisions the officers make by the time they graduate, and that's mostly around force. Mm -hmm. and, isn't that amazing? And most of the situations they get in with force, or at least a large part of that, can be offset or mediated to some degree if they were more effective at making decisions uh, prior to the encounter. Yeah. But law enforcement is an assessment, diagnostic, prescriptive. It's a clinical profession. We don't like to look at it as a clinical. We almost treated our, our, our instructional process as to treat law enforcement as a trade. Uh, and I, ironically, we don't do very good at that because your plumber, your barber, your beautician, your cosmetologist easily get between four and 10 times more training than does your police officer. Yeah, and I was reading a job of yeah. training as a trade. I don't remember where I read it, but it had this. It, it was the, the dog groomer gets like over eight hundred hours of training, right? And the police, the typical police officer, gets you know four, four hundred, five hundred, or something like that, and they're dealing with or, or seven hundred, right? But if if you work for Petco and you're you're dog grooming for Petco, it's eight hundred hours of training you have to get. But, <laughs> but you could be a cop in Ontario with less training than that. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, making decisions yeah. about force and liberty and death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. What about um, what about retention of the current training model? Um, is it something that uh, you know people lose after a short time? Is it something that they typically retain? Is there sort of like a um, how effective is it at police officers retaining what they learn? Well, what we found, and we measured physical skills because you could easily measure that. It is hard to measure uh, paraphrasing, for instance. 
uh, or or uh, paraverbals and, and the use of para paraverbals. Uh, and, and so uh, physical skills are easy to measure. We measured physical skills, but it's all taught in the same way. So we think that there's a crossover in application of the results. And I said uh, earlier that by time officers leave the academy, their skills, their functional skills are not functional in an open comp competitive situation. Mm -hmm. They are not functional even in a non-competitive controlled situation where they just have to demonstrate something. They can talk about it, but they can't do it in the academy before they graduate. They do it when they're taught the skill, but it erodes to the extent where it's not functional by the time they graduate. Yeah. And I, mean, I wonder how I wonder how realistic it is too. Like I don't know if the training really reflects a high stress situation, you know, that you're going to be dealing with in when you're when you're out there in the real world versus what you're doing in the academy. I don't know. Well, when we tested, and certainly the, the Brits are being recommended as, as a way for us to model, and I think, I think they do a lot of good things, but uh, we tested uh, their training program, and we were actually ran it by some of the uh, experts in the United Kingdom in motor learning and control, um, and we found that they were less effective than Canada or the US, but most importantly, they could not use resistance on any of the techniques that they learned in the academy because if they used resistance, someone might be injured in the academy. And, and that speaks to the very point that you were talking about because uh, how much force can you use in practice? How realistic does it get? And particularly if the first time you encounter resistance uh, is on the street and you're scrambling to figure out what to do, it's too late. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we, we need to build skills to a much higher level in what we're doing. And we need to provide great decision making with that. And that's right across the whole process. We are firm believers in, in de-escalation. In fact, when I, when I taught and was a program director and a chairperson uh, in, in the law enforcement program and the Department of Government, um, I taught a 180 hour class in crisis intervention, combining physical, tactical skills uh, firearm skills with communication. So by the time people were finished, they were de-escalating an armed suicidal subject, uh, coordinating in and out of perimeters, directing the suicidal person one of six possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a really kind of a unique kind of combination that we have to do and, and because you're making points right along. You get information from an academy, you'll make a decision about what type of information do I need and what type of my plan am I going to make as I approach this person? What's my yeah. opening statement, my opening line, my positioning? Those are, are decisions we have got to take before people leave the academy. Are there any are there any standards for training? Or I mean, who decides you know that hey, this program is you know, up to snuff or, or whatever. I mean, do you find that it, it's somewhat fractured that, you know, one academy is doing one thing, another academy is doing something else? Uh, or is there some kind of national federal standard? Right. Well, in the, uh, in the United States, uh, we run from 400 plus hours to 1600 plus hours. And that ranges uh, from um, some of our Southern states to California is running the highest. Uh, when I was director of the program, we had 1,650 hours for our police training program at, at Minnesota State. It's dropped significantly now, uh, but that was that was the uh, amount of time that we had. Uh, and the standards were set by individual state post boards. Um, so it really varies pretty dramatically. Yeah. And, and the same in, in Canada. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about some of the research. Um, that, uh, that that's on your website. First off, let me just, I, I wanna bring this up for some people, but if, if anyone's watching this and is interested, there's a whole bunch of references and articles on the uh, the Force Science uh, website. You can just go to forcescience.org. Um, tons of material here, uh, articles. Actually, their, their news section is actually quite good. There's some good information there as well. So I thought I'd point that out because I, I picked up some of the uh, the information there as well. Um, there's a, There was a paper of uh, Bozeman et al. in 2017. It's use of force. Uh, it talks about the use of force is rare in the police world with less than one-tenth of a percent of uh, all calls for service and 0.78% of all uh, criminal arrests. So it's it's very, very infrequent. But the mm -hmm. point is, 
that even though it's very rare, it can be a very expensive in, in Denver when you're talking about the loss of life, lawsuits, and all this other stuff, right? The, there's no question. The tragedy that is involved in police use of force affects everybody. Uh, the individual that the force is directed against, the officer, and the force may be directed at the officer as well, uh, the families and the communities. And if you want to talk finances, uh, the top 10 cities in the United States lose $1.2 billion, billion dollars a year in civil suits, and about a third of that is connected to police practice. And so it is, uh, if you start looking nationally, uh, it is really a very expensive process for communities. And the, and the irony is the pocket that pays that isn't connected to the pocket that pays for police training. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's almost, <laughs> uh, it's, it's just an amazing chasm. And I, I, I don't know how to link those two. Uh, but if uh, there's no question that if we could provide better training, uh, we'd provide better service. Well, I, I would like to mention one study that's not published, but but we t we um, with eight universities we tested 400 undergraduate students and asked them about the frequency of police use of deadly force. And I don't know where they got it from, but you just quoted a uh, how minute the statistic is. It's actually less than one percent of all arrest situations is any level of force used. Mm -hmm. And deadly force is like a thousandth of 1% of that. It's just, it is so remote, it's just amazing. But when we asked uh, 400 university students, and it's an unfinished study, uh, the average number of shootings is one out of every five citizen contacts. Now, I understand where there are riots because if people believe that cops are using force at that level that frequently, it's amazing. And I don't know where they get it from. Uh, they may watch NCIS. They may watch LA SWAT. I don't know. But, but yeah. the perception is so different from the reality. It yeah, well, shocking. I want to talk about, I, actually, I, I do want to bring that up in, in terms of the cases and, and things like that and, and maybe some of the things you've worked on. Uh, but of course, there's especially most recently uh, George Floyd and in the past, you know, like Walter Scott and a lot of these things, they just make, they explode, right? And then they cause a lot of problems. Right. Um, so right. maybe, yeah, maybe it, it, it appears that they're more frequent because we see them in the media a lot more and they make the news. Uh, but of course you don't hear about the thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions on a daily basis where nothing happens, right? And, and everything works out. So yeah. Um, right. There's another paper uh, in Applied Ergonomics 2018, Unintentional Discharge of Firearms in Law Enforcement. And that had to do with uh, inv involuntary muscle contraction and contralateral irradiation uh, and startle response. So different mechanisms that could potentially uh, cause an officer to you know, unintentionally discharge a firearm. And uh, what was interesting there was that routine tasks accounted for a large percentage of the unintentional discharges. It was just mm -hmm. something, you know, typical stuff that they were doing. Right. The, there's an error that is uh, very common. I, it, it actually causes one third, and it's an error type. If you look at James Reason, uh, who's written done the, the most scholarly work, just retired in uh, uh, research on errors. In fact, he's written the book Errors uh, about 20 years ago. And if something falls out of a sequence, it's called the lapse error. And the first step in field stripping, a, a weapon that is striker trigger fired, meaning it's it's like a Glock. It's like a Glock trigger with the safety in the trigger, which actually releases I mean, some of the mechanism. The, this is your expert area, not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they, uh, if they uh, go to field strip that, the first step, and we will ask this to the class, what's the first step in field stripping that? And they'll say, pull the trigger. I, and that's not the first step. The first step is to drop the magazine and clear the chamber. Um, but if you have not had enough practice at this, which is characteristic of the police profession, uh, the first thing you do after a year of not attending your gun and now you're going to go qualify and you're going to clean it before you qualify, you drop the magazine and pull the trigger. Yeah, yeah uh, interesting. 
Yeah, and, and it's called a lapse error, and it's one of the more common types of human errors. Interesting. But, but yeah, but that's that said, yeah. When Glock first started in the in the US, they would spend as much as four hours on field stripping over the course of a three-day conversion program. And now departments are spending a half hour on field stripping and cleaning the weapon. Really? Uh -huh. Interesting. Interesting. There's an interesting correlation between uh a limited amount of instruction and the amount of errors you have uh there's another paper it, it's interesting because you, you you focus on a lot of different areas uh, areas uh there's one in law and human behavior 2016 memory and the operational witness and this one is interesting to me because uh i remember when i was working on the uh walter scott case um this came up and that was you know <laughs> it's almost you're damned both ways, right? So the officer, you know, he, he's doing his best to recall this is what he remembers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then it's like, well, you know, you didn't remember it exactly. And then I remember one of the, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Dr. Charles Morgan saying something, well, if everything was described exactly as, you know, as it happened, I would be very suspicious, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we don't expect people. In fact, people don't remember things exactly the same, nor do they perceive them exactly the same. Um, and so there was a test that you, you ran where um, I believe it was the there was like an encounter with an officer. And I, th I think there's like a, a suspect pulls like a weapon or something like that. And right. you had two officers. One was an observer and one was doing the interaction. And one of them in particular, uh, or I think one fifth of them or about one fifth of them actually thought they saw uh, like the weapon being pointed at them or something like that. Is that do you remember that one? Uh, yeah, that was published in the uh, journal Law and Human Behavior, the American Psychological Association uh, Journal Law and Human Behavior. A and what we were looking at was cognitive load and how much cognitive load we have and how much would be tied up if an officer was actually trying to solve a problem uh, versus observing. Uh, and uh, I don't know if, if, if you're aware of this, but we have very little in the way of cognitive load or desktop space. We have a lot of memory and storage space, but we have almost no desktop space. Uh, and that accounts for why we have laws against cell phone use and texting and driving is because we have such little desktop space, we can't manage multiple things at the same time very well. Uh, and so uh, we thought that if an officer was tied up trying to solve a problem, might that part of their desktop space that's solving the problem interfere with some of the uh, acquisition and uh, retention of, of memory, not just from the point of view uh, of what their attentional resources were directed to, but from the point of view of the available memory space for them. Uh, and what we observed in comparing uh, officers who were active versus officers who were uh, observers is the active officer uh, their memory was similar to the uh, observing officer right up until the last uh, couple of seconds when they had to make a decision, they had to solve a problem. And once they got directed into that, their memory diminished significantly. And we think it's because of the attentional resources directed toward a task of solving a problem and then engaging a motor movement to address that. All of that ties up some of our cognitive space and diminishes the capacity to uh, to remember things, not just intentionally, mm -hmm. but also from the point of view of what resources we have for consolidating that memory. Yeah, that's interesting. And also, I mean, there was a paper it, sort of along those lines, would have to, which had to do with performing under pressure. It was the one in human movement science in 2012, uh, gaze control, decision making and shooting performance. And um, there's a, not a notable difference between elite or experienced people versus you know, a rookie that just comes out of an academy in 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 terms of um, where they're looking, how they're looking, uh, you know, when and how they shoot. In fact, there's there's measurable time differences there as well. Right, right, and and uh, we we looked at this after we did a study on attention because we, we were finding that there was a, a difference in the amount of attention that officers were able to give to something uh, and subsequently a significant difference in their memory and that kind of connected to the level of experience. So we were looking at um, elite or expert performers versus regularly trained officers like those who were graduating from North American Police Academy. And, and we found an immense difference in skill, first of all, uh, an immense difference in attention. 
because the skill means that the officer has to direct their attention to the operation of the response, meaning the drawing, the presenting of the weapon, the decision to shoot, all of that pulls them away from the observation about what is happening there. So we put eye scan, we, we got Joan Vickers and got her the latest equipment. She's author of the, uh, the book, Perception, Cognition, Decision Training done a lot of work with, with Olympic athletes and, uh, and teaching them how to look and see in the middle of, of an engagement. And she assessed the vision of these officers. And we, we did find a significant difference, not only because of the skill level, the operational skill, but also because those officers who made great decisions and knew what, where, when, and how to look, they had a high level of clinical experience and the person who has experience, who really understands the environment in which they will need to work, do much better at it. So whether it's a police officer or following that, Joan did a study with Canadian surgeons and found that the skilled surgeon looked at where they were cutting and the effect of it on five cuts ahead. And the novice surgeon looked at where they were cutting and the effect on one cut ahead. And, and so the, it really speaks about the need for expertise and decision-making, how to read, how to influence people. And that may be the most significant thing we are missing in police training, mm -hmm. especially today where people spend so much time on their cell phones and iPads uh, and such little interaction with people reading and understanding people and trying to E evoke and convince and persuade it's really a tremendous social skill yeah and the expert officers were great at reading and seeing and understanding how situations could evolve and the novice was scrambling from behind and then had to figure out how to use their tool <laughs> and by that time they were seconds out of the time when the threat presented and when they responded and the implications forensically for this is they could not tell us what happened for the last second or so of the incident and their bullet strike would be at a very different place than when they made the decision on the evolving threat to act to respond that's interesting so you you know you mentioned time and i was just thinking in my head that uh, a lot of the studies that you do also deal with well two things time and distance and um, so you know how much time an officer may have to respond to an action, uh, you know, or whatever, and then also how much distance or how much space that they have to, you know, perform a function or a duty. And I guess it all com does come back down to time. But uh, one of the studies you did, which had to do with the speed of a prone subject, you know, you found somebody can, you know, fractions of a second is really what we're talking about. And so they don't have a lot. So um, maybe you can talk about some of the, the, the timing issues, the distance issues. I mean, it seems like are, are the officers always at a disadvantage? If we nail it down to simply action-reaction, uh, the officer's always at a disadvantage. Uh, but the key with the professional is the professional always uh, ahead of time tries to understand so they can contain and control and diminish the threat. For instance, on our traffic stop study, we found that once the driver begins to assault the, uh, the officer, and it doesn't matter which way the officer approaches the vehicle, uh, once the driver begins to assault the officer, the officer is behind the curve. Uh, but the approach of an officer to a vehicle, how they approach the vehicle, and how they are able to establish psychological contact and influence and read what's happening in the vehicle are powerful controls in mitigating the possibility that the person they are addressing will assault them. If they can psychologically manage, influence, uh, contain and control the person inside the vehicle, uh, they are at a significantly less threat. And subsequently, it no longer becomes a case of uh, your action will beat my reaction unless I do something first. It's a matter of how I am, how am I as a professional uh, needing to address the concerns that I have with you so that I can effectively engage you and accomplish my professional mission. And, and that, that really is the key. And it connects directly to a... Uh, multiple studies done by the FBI Academy, uh, particularly by their lead behavioral scientist, uh, Dr. Pinizzato, uh, who found that uh, assailants on police officers are reading them all the time. And those that are professional in their practice and contact, 
significantly diminish the threat potential, even by homicidal assailants because of the influence they have on mitigating the circumstances and the potential for threat. And that's really where our work is designed to go. Mm -hmm. If you get to this point, it's a losing game. Therefore, you should never be there. What do you need to do to manage it before you get there? Yeah. What would you say? This is the hard question now. What, what would you say to people who are critical of your work and saying, ah, you know, he's just he's just a guy. He's there to, you know, he's there for the cops. Doesn't matter what happens. He's just going to say whatever. Um, you know, do do you? I mean, do you have any? Do you have any sort of understanding of where maybe some of these people might be coming from, or how would you address some of their concerns? Well, one of the things, and and I hate to be cynical. Uh, but I used to think that there was uh, justice, <laughs> and that <Yeah. laughs> it was a, it was a fair fight in court, uh, and that uh, everybody got to be heard. Uh, and I, I really learned very differently that uh, uh, there there are many people that have a vested interest. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the, there's as I mentioned, uh, 1.2 mil billion dollars a year in civil suits. Um, it, that's a lot of money. Uh, and if uh, our research uh, impairs civil suits and some unjust, perceived unjust prosecution, uh, there are going to be people who are really angry at us uh, because we have bit them in places where they don't like to get bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's um, and they have reasons. In fact, the, the head of defense um, civil suit litigation for Los Angeles uh, has phrased us that if people can can attack the messenger, uh, they can block the message, and and that's really that's very true because uh, when I get on stand in court, I, I have to deflect statements made in in the press versus the publication. You know, we're looking at uh, at this point in time we have uh, thirty peer reviewed publications, and we're on board for another five by Christmas time, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, those are journal reviewers and editors that are saying this is good work and we're applying it in an appropriate way. And never in court has anyone ever said our conclusions are wrong. Well, I mean, if it's uh, not scientific. Yeah. And that's just the thing. So if you follow a scientific method and you're doing things and it's getting peer reviewed, I mean, if there's any concern, it's your peers that have to bring them up and say, hey, look, there's a problem here. Right. So, yeah, no, I can I can understand that. Right. Um, it, the allegations are made uh, and they're made in the press. And, and the issue is, uh, can I testify in court? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, let me ask you about training. I want to ask you about the, the Force Science Institute training. You seem to have a very successful training program, uh, the, the, the certification class. Um, what can you tell us about some of the offerings that you have in terms of training and what, how you prepare uh, people that come through your course, your certification class. The, yeah. Well, our, our really capstone uh, sort of courses, our, our high-end courses, uh, our, our certification course and our advanced specialist course. There's no question. We offer a number of other courses, and I'd be happy to speak those, about those. Our certification course, our teaching faculty, our five MDs, uh, all but two are trauma specialists, uh, heading trauma teams uh, in their hospitals uh, and uh, in their teaching units. Uh, and two to our, our GPs. Uh, we have four PhD psychologists. Um, only one has no police experience. Um, but, uh, uh, and then we have uh, uh, attorneys that work for uh, Lexapol uh, and some top ranked uh, international trainers. And that's our teaching staff for our five day cert course. Now they'll only get uh, two MDs and four PhDs uh, in, in any five-day course, and we change in and out. But we cover all of the aspects of human behavior connected to a force encounter. Uh, and we look at it from the point of view of an investigator, uh, as well as an adjudicator of fact, could be within a professional adjudicator, or it could be uh, a legal. Uh, and and what, what does that person need to know about the human performance elements so they can make an appropriate decision? Uh, and by the way, uh, none of what we cover in those courses actually exceeds uh, any of the human performance information that has gone into crash scene reconstruction for the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. 
um, because we cover perception, cognition, decision making, memory issues, yeah. uh, and and ironically, we draw on similar sources. Our advanced specialist course uh, takes it to a much higher level. Uh, the students, it's a 300-hour course. It covers uh, for about four and a half months. We meet every couple of weeks online. Students are working online that whole time, uh, reading the literature, and then they get to have a, a group discussion. And then for an hour, uh, every two weeks, they will meet the lead authors of that. For instance, um, the, I mentioned the type of decision-making that's most characteristic of officers in a time-compressed circumstance is recognition prime or naturalistic decision-making or fast and frugal. And, and the lead researcher on recognition prime and naturalistic is Gary Klein, who's co-authored articles with Kahneman, who's won a Nobel Prize on decision-making. Uh, and the students get to interview Gary Klein uh, about recognition prime decision-making and how it relates to the type of decision process they're either training in the academy or they're investigating as investigators. Uh, we'll look at motor learning and performance and uh, Tim Lee out of McMaster's 40 years experience at McMaster's co-author of motor, motor learning and performance. Um, they get to interview Tim Lee after they've read much of his work and, and how to train that and the implications of poor training or good training on motor performance and its, its uh, effect on cognition, perception and memory. And so they get to interview Tim Lee. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really a very advanced course. We, we do offer uh, one-day acquaintance courses. Uh, for instance, I just did a, uh, a one-day course for California Highway Patrol, uh, and they're also involved shooting unit because they're doing much more now that they have to investigate um, a necessity standard as well as a reasonable standard, and it means they do a very different type of interviewing, and they're looking for some different type of things. And so I spent a day-long uh, uh, program in San Diego recently with 120 uh, California Highway Patrol uh, homicide investigators. Uh, um, but uh, I, I just finished a, a one day with Miami-Dade homicide. Uh, now, this week we've done a two-day on de-escalation, um, and I think it's Nashville. Um, so we do a variety of, of different courses, all connecting to human performance right, uh, right. within that. Excellent. And within our, within our de-escalation program, we're also looking significantly at human performance and trying to read and understand dynamics and how it connects to officer safety, as well as the safety of the individual the officer is dealing with. Well, it, it must be a popular course. You've got, uh, I think you see, you've posted something like more than 10,000 students. I, I don't know if that's on the certification course or just uh, for all the courses combined, but. That's just on the certification course. We're wow, somewhere in the realm of 12,000 students now. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And so do you normally recommend people will do the, like the certification and then the, obviously it would make sense, I guess, to do the advanced after that, uh, that's a, a follow-up to the, the certification course? The certification course is the best way to go if you really want to understand human performance and high stress encounters. Uh, and, and we cover everything from the biomechanics to uh, we, we do have uh, one of our, uh, our medical staff, uh, actually a uh, fair number of medical staff deal with sudden death in custody. So they have done the research on uh, proning, positional asphyxiation, uh, the uh, blood flow issues with uh, vascular neck restraint uh, and um, recording uh, blood flow and oxygen saturation in the frontal lobes versus the lower brainstem. Um, you know, there's, um, yeah, uh, taser, taser use, mm -hmm. um, uh, chemical issues with, with death in custody. You mentioned, uh, George Floyd, right. uh, you know, and, and the connection to, uh, w the chemicals he had on board, how that might've influenced, uh, his response to what the officer was doing. Mm -hmm. What, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you're obviously taking a lot of this and you're consulting as well. So. Uh, about how often do you get out and, and testifying in a year? Well, I, I don't testify very much anymore. I, okay. what, what I do is uh, I consult on cases, and we have quite an active consulting business. Uh, and I will analyze the case and detail out the types of uh, factors that should be involved. For instance, we, we looked at an area that you're highly interested in and skillful in, which is ejected cartridge casing. Mm -hmm. And, and what do we know about that? And how does it relate to it? And if you need an expert, Eugene's the guy to go to. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so we, we make we make the right we make the recommendation for that. Right. So it's uh, 
Yeah, you know, we'll look at the factors that need to be involved, but if it's ejected cartridge casings or if it's uh, gunshot residue or if it's something else, but mainly our focus is on human performance and how these things connect to Man. human performance and how that then connects to the forensic evidence. Are there any cases that really stand out for you? Something you worked on or consulted on that was just like, man, like we're, we're really making a difference here or we're really helping here. You know, maybe things were not as they seemed when you walked in and then it's just like, you know, us, you know, everything just starts to connect or is there any of those that you can talk about? Well, I'll, I'll give you one uh, from Ontario, uh, Toronto Police Service. Uh, an officer was charged uh, for shooting at a vehicle uh, as was driving away. <clears throat> he said the vehicle attempted to uh, run him down uh, and he fired three shots. Uh, the, he was in front of the vehicle as he accelerated toward him just off the left front fender. Um, he had his gun out. Uh, the first shot went uh, uh, slightly uh, from side to front uh, just behind the B pillar. Uh, and then the second shot went in a little more uh, direct into the rear, and the third shot went uh, directly in, into the rear after that. The person who was driving that vehicle was uh, uh, convicted of assault against a police officer uh, and went to prison. When they got out of prison, they went to get the car. The car happened not to be theirs. It was their uncle's, uh, which they were not supposed to be driving because they were already uh, under some sentence confinement that they could not be out alone at night plus driving a vehicle. Um, so <laughs> they had borrowed their uncle's vehicle and now their uncle's vehicle had bullet holes in it, which the uncle really got angry at and they contacted the uh, SIU. The SIU was unhappy for many reasons, including it was an officer involved shooting, Toronto did not let him know about, uh, <laughs> finding it late and they laid charges against the officer. Um, we got a call uh, and we said, we cannot apply the human performance factors until we understand the forensic factors. And so they had a reconstruction firm out of California get a replica vehicle, uh, give the acceleration rates and the turning uh, that went with that. We matched it with the uh, human performance dynamics from our research. Uh, we gave it to the attorney. The attorney used it to cross the forensic expert with SIU they agreed. By the time I was going to get on the stand to testify, the prosecutor said, uh, Your Honor, <laughs> I've looked at Dr. Lewinsky's report. I've consulted with two of the top police psychologists in North America. They said the report is good to go. I've, I've got to live with it. Uh, we've got agreement <laughs> <laughs> that this report is accurate. And I request the jury convene, convene and find the officer not guilty on all charges and you validate that verdict, whatever the language is. So that was um, a, a rare occurrence. <laughs> that was a, that's a rare occurrence in the court system. And by the way, one SIU investigator was really happy and very congratul congratulatory to, uh, to us after. Uh, and the other investigator scowled at me the rest of the trial. <laughs> so it's a reflection of you, you can't win with everybody no matter whether or not you prove something with science or not, somebody's going to always be unhappy because it contravenes what they thought about it. Yeah, well, yeah, there's always two sides, right? So yeah, always. you're right. Yeah, it's, just, it's one half is never gonna be happy, that's for sure. Right. Um, well, we're, get, we're getting on in time here, but I'd like to know what is next for you? What is next for force science? What, what are some of the areas that you really want to focus on? I mean, you mentioned some papers that are coming up, but where, where are things moving to? And, and what do you think are, you know, the sort of the, the future right now uh, for you guys? Well, the, the research that we're, uh, we're publishing now is using uh, high speed uh, measurements on uh, kinesthetics. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes, uh, repeating all of our original studies on assault time and turning time and movement time and that sort of thing. And it's 15 sort of devices uh, downloading data every sub 1,000th of a second. Uh, and we're using that and high-speed motion capture systems to repeat some of our earlier studies and get much more precise measurement of it. And we're discovering some really amazing things. Um, on top of that, we're also using the same devices to look at um, attack postures. For instance, with edge weapon attacks, and I know the 
uh, knife uh, issue in the uh, um, cable car, whatever it was, in, in Toronto, where the individual uh, who was in the midst of mental health crisis had an edge weapon, the officer shot him. The, they made reference to the 21-foot rule. 21-foot rule has nothing to do with most officer edge weapon assaults. Most officers are, are stabbed within six to nine feet. Um, at least 13% of every officer in the U.S. that is injured is injured in edge weapon attacks. It's very prevalent. Uh, in fact, four times more people are killed in the United States by edge weapons than by rifles. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's so we're, we're very interested in this close in encounter. Yeah, that was got, the, okay. uh, just sorry, just the, that was the Sammy Yatim case. Uh, was the, the the young man that was on the thing? I actually, and I happened to work on that case as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we should hear a, a good Canadian beer over that sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, but but we've got publications in the um, uh, International Journal of Exercise Science and Applied Ergonomics uh, dealing with movement and dynamic factors. And right now we've got accelerometers and gyroscopes measuring edge weapon attacks, totally apart from time to close. Uh, and time to, it's it's about stepping and stabbing, stepping and slashing, and all of that. And um, there's no question that uh, edge weapon attacks all occur for the most part in under a fifth of a second. Mm -hmm. But our most uh, interesting study uh, is one that we're planning for this coming May, uh, in which we're going to be uh, incorporating uh, experts from multiple universities, including many Canadian universities, uh, in which we'll be looking at. Uh, uh, an officer engaged in a high stress, rapidly unfolding encounter, and we'll be measuring all sorts of physiological responses and comparing that to the officer's experience and performance in a stress situation. We'll get head cameras, body cameras, and we'll be comparing that and the memory people have of that to the memory of the officer who actually went through the experience. Because most of the research on memory and trauma comes from people who watch videos mm -hmm. and watching a trauma video is nowhere near coming face to face with someone with the intent and ability to kill you who's acting on it now right and and so we're thinking there's a huge gap in that research and we would like to understand what that gap is that's really and, cool and then we're, yeah we'll look at memory we're, we're tying up people on uh with sleep consolidation of uh, memory issues uh, and there appears to be some connection. The latest research on uh, on REM appears to be connecting to consolidation of uh, episodic memory. Uh, and so when's the best time to interview a witness mm -hmm. or a victim or an officer or an assailant uh, in connection to that? Those are all critical issues that will be arising out of that, making recommendations out of that from that study. Amazing. That's great stuff. Excellent, excellent topics. Um, I see we're getting on to almost an hour, so I think I'm gonna we're gonna call it a close. But uh, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. It's fascinating stuff. I could talk to you for much longer than this. Uh, you've got some really interesting projects going on, and I know some really good, uh, uh, you know, just good topics of discussion and training and everything else. So thank you again. I wish you all the best of success with, uh, with Force Science Institute and uh, hang back here. I'm just going to make a quick announcement and then I'm, I'm going to okay. come back in. And thank I'll you. Very much. Appreciate being on. All right. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, that does it for episode 11. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, just a couple of things. And that was the uh, Cloud Compare course. It's coming up on the 23rd of November. Next week, the IABPA conference, that's the Bloodstain Pattern Analysis uh, uh, Analyst Conference that's coming up uh, the 16th through the 20th. Uh, three different regions, it's like 27 presentations and all for 30 bucks, it's pretty cheap. Next week, I'm gonna have Mr. Roland Engel, who's a professional engineer uh, on the September 11th, 2001. Uh, we, we know about the tragic story that happened where the World Trade Center towers uh, fell and crashed. Uh, there was also a World Trade Center 7 building that crashed as well. And uh, Mr. Angle uh, has been studying that collapse and he's going to talk to us about what may or may not have happened uh, based on a study that was done at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So on that note, everybody, all the best and we'll see you next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Bye-bye.